Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, Chasing His Presence. I know that some Christians or some pastors don't agree with chasing God's presence. But give this a listen and you decide. You be the judge if we should stand idly by while the presence of Jesus comes and slowly goes without us ever interacting with it. So just give us an opportunity here. Turn with me to our scripture found in Mark chapter 6 verse 30 through 34. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. See, Jesus had called the twelve to him, and he had commissioned them and given them authority over unclean spirits, and he sent them out two by two. Now, they had returned from their mission trip and was reporting to Jesus all their success, everything that they had taught, everything that they had done, everything that they had seen. But Jesus realized that they needed a little break, a sabbatical, if you will, a little time to rest up because they needed to rest physically, spiritually, and mentally. And there were too many people coming and going, so they couldn't achieve that. They couldn't even eat. There were so many people. So they needed to get away so that they could recharge after giving so much of themselves. Okay, now verse 32. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them go in and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd and he began to teach them many things. Now, the word translated presence denotes face or the side, front side or the countenance or the, the, the countenance of man or the countenance of God. Countenance is the appearance or the form or characteristics of something as it is seen. It is the presence or the personal existence of something in a particular place or a particular space that usually, get this, that usually interacts with objects around it. In other words, the countenance of a person affects those he or she interacts with. I'm sure you've heard the, the saying, she has an infectious smile. See, she's interacting with those, or she's a affecting those that she's interacting with because of her infectious smile. When you see her smiling, it makes you want to smile as well. My wife has an infectious smile. Now, if the countenance of a person affects those he or she interacts with, I want you to watch this now, how much more will the countenance of God affect those who seek or who chase after his countenance or chase after his presence. I want you to think about that for just a moment. Now, could it possibly be that the reason we do not see more signs and more wonders and miracles in our day to day, like they did back in the first century, is because we do not chase the presence of Jesus like they did back then. And I'm just thinking, right? I'm just thinking out loud here. I mean, our text said that the people ran, or you could say that they chased after him. I want us to read that verse again. Verse 33. Now many saw them go in and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. 
they anticipated where they were going. They thought about it. And they said, okay, there's only one direction, so we got to go in that direction. And they ran around. And they, they, they saw the boat, right? The boat was leaving. They saw people getting into the boat. And they realized, Jesus and his disciples, they're leaving. And they came from all the towns all around and they ran around this lake. They took the long path and they beat Jesus and his disciples to the other side and got there ahead of them. They were like, "Uh uh-uh, Jesus, you're not leaving here without a touch, without you touching me, without you touching my family. You're not leaving here without us getting a blessing. We ain't going to get our miracle today because miracles are with you. Miracles are in your presence. And you're not just going to leave without us getting our miracle. We're going to be chasing your presence. We want your countenance to shine down upon us because we need a miracle and we need a miracle today. Today is the day of our miracle. See, these people saw something in Jesus that was worth chasing. They were not satisfied with what he had already done, what he had already given out. They wanted something more. They wanted more and more of Jesus. And can you blame them? They were like a psalmist in in Psalms 42, verse 1 through 2. It says, as the heart, and in some, some versions, it says, as the deer, Panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? The problem is we don't hunger and thirst after the presence of God. We barely make it up to church on a Sunday morning, much less chase his presence. It's just too much work for us. I ain't running around no lake. You know how far that is? I'm going to get me a cappuccino. Are you coming? That is our response today. We're too spiritually lazy to chase after the presence of Jesus. And we don't want anyone leaving us behind. So that's the reason why some discourage others from chasing the presence of God. Because they don't want to be left by themselves. So they got to discourage you from chasing the presence, but don't let them. They don't want to chase the presence, and they don't want you to chase the presence either. This is what I need you to understand. The presence, or the face, or the countenance, they're all the same thing. It comes from the same word. Now, watch this. The face, the countenance of God is the sign of his blessing and the sign of his favor upon his people. Look with me at the priestly blessing of God with which the priests were to put God's name on his people. Numbers chapter 6, verse 22 through 27. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons saying thus, You shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. The countenance or the presence of God affects those with whom it comes into contact with. You cannot come into contact with God or his countenance or his presence or see his face and not be changed, not be blessed. See, notice with me that the word translated face in verse 25 is the same exact word translated countenance in verse 26. It is the same exact word. So it could read like this. The Lord make his face or his countenance to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Verse 26. The Lord lift up his countenance or lift up his face upon you and give you peace. 
It is the same exact word. They are interchangeable. So then, if they are the same word, then it would stand to reason that if you are chasing the presence of God, you would have to be actively seeking the face of God, the very thing that he instructed us to do. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, and we're also going to go to Psalms 27, verse 8. But first, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now turn with me to Psalm 27 verse 8. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. We are instructed to seek the face of God. This is beyond dispute. No way can you argue against it. No how can you deny it. You just can't. We are to chase the presence of Almighty God. Matter of fact, look at what happens when the presence of God is taken away. We got to read verse 9 of that same psalm that, that we just read. Psalm 27, verse 9. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. Hide not your face from me. Or hide not your presence, or hide not your countenance from me. Do not hide your presence from me, O oh God, for if you do, you will take away my help, and your anger will be against me, and I will be like one that has been cast off. Now turn with me, please, to the story of Cain after he murdered his brother Abel. God pronounced a judgment on him. Genesis chapter 4, verse 13 through 14. It says, Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Cain said to the Lord, he said to God, he said, God, you're driving me away from the ground or the place or the land where your presence dwell or where you own. So then I will be hidden from your face or I'll be hidden from the countenance of God, resulting in him losing his way and becoming a wanderer upon the earth and he will lose his God protection because he will no longer be under the countenance or under the presence of Almighty God, which means protection, which means help. So after learning what we just studied, I can't understand why some pastors will preach against chasing after the presence of God or chasing after the presence of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. I just don't understand that. They claim that we should not be chasing the presence because the presence is in us. I think that's weak. Because granted, yes, the presence is in us. But to claim that we should not be chasing the presence because the presence is already in us would suggest one of two things. One, we have nothing to do in attracting the presence or in maintaining the presence of Almighty God. Or two, or th that since we have the presence inside us already, we don't need anything else. That's all we need. We don't need anything more. Either way, it is a pretty sad situation to be in. And what's more, I want to find out from them, why did Jesus instruct us in John chapter 15, verse 3 through 8? He said, abide in me, 
and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you, you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. It seems to me that Jesus has put the onus on us to make sure that we are pursuing him by instructing us to abide in him so that he can abide in us. Otherwise, we will grow weak from lack of spiritual exercise. What about the great apostle Paul? He said, but I follow after if I may apprehend that which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. You know what? That is such a good portion of scripture. I want to read the whole thing. Let us turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 15. Read in the ESV. Not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Now, when Paul said that he was, he, he, he pressed on, he is saying that he is working hard to, one, pursue the things of God. Two, pursue the purposes of God. In other words, he was pursuing or chasing after his calling. And number three, he was pursuing the presence of God. See, you cannot pursue these things without pursuing the giver of those things. It is impossible. Besides, Paul said, let the mature think this way. Only the immature thinks that <clears throat> we don't need to chase the presence of Jesus. We don't need to be chasing his presence. But the mature says, I'm going to apprehend that which I was apprehended. I'm going to chase after it until I grab hold of it. See, Jacob wrestled with the angel of God all night long. And he refused to let him go until he blessed him. See, if he wasn't chasing the presence, he would have never got his blessing. If he let go too, too quickly because the presence was already inside of him, he would have never got his blessing. But he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So to me, to say that we should not be preaching or we should not be pursuing his presence or chasing after his presence, it's either it's an excuse for spiritual laziness or lack of understanding. I know that it's a lot of work to maintain and grow a strong, vibrant relationship with Jesus. But anything good is not easy. It's hard work, but it is worth it. So I suppose that the reason why some pastors who preach against it or preach against chasing the presence aren't seeing miracles in their services is because they don't chase after the presence. For without the presence, there are no miracles. 
You got to have the presence before you can have the miracles. And that's why the people, those Jews, chased the presence all around the lake. They ran. They, their wives, their children, their whole family, they ran on ahead. And they did not stop until they got to the other side ahead of Jesus so that the presence would shine upon him, that he would lift up his countenance upon them. They wanted something more. And you see, that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, It is those who hunger and thirst for righteousness that shall be satisfied. We must chase his presence if we expect to apprehend that which we've been apprehended. I want you to think about this for a moment. If the blind man or those blind men sitting by the roadside in Jericho had not continuously yelled out to Jesus to have mercy upon them, what do you suppose would have happened? What if they had yielded to the shouts of the crowd to shut up, be quiet, shut up, you're nothing, he's busy, he's a busy man, just shut up. What do you suppose would have happened? Do you suppose they would have gotten their healing? I say no. Jesus would have walked right past them and they would have missed the last opportunity they had to receive a miracle if they had not been chasing after his presence. If they had not shouted out to Jesus to lift up his countenance upon them and grant them the miracle that they so desired. They desired to see. They wanted to see. It's the same thing that's true with the disciples in the storm. I want us to read that account. Mark chapter 6, verse 47 through 51. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone, that's Jesus, he was alone on the land, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. He was going to pass them by. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astonished. Jesus would have passed them by had they not cried out in fear. They were probably hollering for, for, for Jesus, as it were, anyway. They would probably say, Jesus, help us. Where are you, Lord Jesus? There's a ghost. We need you, Lord. Not knowing that it was him who was walking and would have passed them by if they had not pursued his presence. If they had not been hollering and crying out, he would have passed them by. See, sometimes we don't always recognize the move at first glance because sometimes, and I say sometimes, right? It is only revealed to those who are actively chasing his presence. And I want us to look at what happens when the presence of God shows up because someone else is pursuing or someone is chasing his presence, but you don't recognize the presence of God. Look at what happens. King David was, was dancing with all his might before the Lord. And he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Now the Ark of the Covenant represented the very presence of Almighty God. So he was bringing the presence of God home to Jerusalem to be near him. And his wife, King Saul's daughter, Michael, despised him in her heart. Let us read it, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 20 through 23. And David returned. This is him bringing, bringing home the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And everything was over, and he blessed the people, and he handed out cakes of uh, raisins to, to the people, and he blessed them and sent them home. And now, now, 
David returned to bless his household. But Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel dishonored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants. Now, I want you to, to, to catch that. The, the, it's easy to slip that by. She said, the, the eyes of his servants, female servants. Now, these weren't just servants. These were the lords of the Lord. They, 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 they were the servants of his servants. And they were female. So she said, you, you undress yourself before the eyes of your servants, female servants. As one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel the people of the Lord, and I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. But by these female servants of whom you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. David did not know that his wife was scorning him as he chased after the presence. He went home to bless his own household because he had blessed all of the people. Now he wanted to share that blessing, so he went home to bless his own household. But what did he find? He found that his own wife had despised him in her, in her heart while he was chasing after the presence of God. He, he wanted to share all of his happiness. He wanted to share all of his joy. He wanted her to have some of the blessing that God was blessing him with because he was in the presence of God. He was chasing after the presence. And you cannot be in God's presence and not be affected by it. You will be blessed anytime you get in the presence of God. And so that was where David was at at this time. He was in the presence and he was being blessed. He, he, God has, has heaped all kinds of blessings on him and he was distributing it. He wasn't just it up for himself. He was distributing it to the people. Now he wanted to distribute it to his own family, his, his own household. But before he could, he could, his stush, snobbish, childless, spoiled princess, now queen of a wife, despised him in her heart and he could not bless her. But instead, she received a curse since she did not recognize the day of her visitation because she chose not to chase after the presence. The same is true with us. We will miss our, 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 our opportunities if we do not chase after his presence because if we do not chase, we will not recognize the day of our visitation. And instead of a blessing, we will receive a curse because we did not recognize, because we would not chase. If, if we are afraid to look undignified or to be associated with a certain kind of worshiper and we hold our worship back or we hold ourselves back from worshiping or from pursuing the presence. Or if we're afraid of what people will say when they look at us. If we're afraid that they will look at us with disgust or that they will scorn us in their hearts. Or if they will make fun of us because we worship God with all our hearts. Because we chase after the presence of God with all of our might like David did. And if they like Michael tried to shame King David into submitting to the norm and we submit, then we're in trouble because instead of a blessing, we could receive a curse. But you see, David wasn't like that. He was not easily swayed because with all her attempts, to embarrass him into dialing down his offering of worship 
to his God. He was offering this worship to God because it was before him that he was dancing with all his might. He was chasing after the presence of his God. All of that, her attempt to dissuade him did not work. Why? Because David was a worshiper. He would not be ashamed. He would not be embarrassed. He would not let himself be talked into, nor would he be beguiled into tuning down his worship of the one and only true God. Oh Lord, let the worshipers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. Let us extol the God of hosts, the Lord God Almighty. Let us praise the King of Kings. Let us lift up his name on high. Oh Lord, let your worshipers arise and let us chase your presence and seek your face. And let us call upon that matchless name, the mighty and holy name of the Lord our God. The Lord is good and his love endures forever. His mercies are everlasting. He will not let us seek him or seek his face or seek his presence in vain. He will reveal himself to us and he will turn and leave a blessing. See, Daniel, he also was a worshiper. He said in Daniel chapter nine, verse three, then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Daniel was chasing the presence of God. Daniel did not care who said what or who thought what. He did not care that the government had shut down the church for 30 days. He did not care that the government said, shut up your churches, close your doors for the next 30 days. You cannot worship God in public anymore for the next 30 days. He did not care about the decree that went out. He did not care that prayer was outlawed and that prayer was politically incorrect. He said, whether someone go with me or whether I go alone, whether I go by myself, yet will I go. And you better believe that Daniel went. You better believe that Daniel prayed. And you better believe that God answered him when he prayed. So let me ask you, do you have promises today? unfulfilled promises. I want you to know that God said that all of his promises are yea and amen. Do you have unfulfilled desires? God said that he will give you the desires of your heart if you delight yourself in him. And I'm not talking now to the lukewarm. That's not who I'm talking to. I'm not talking to the wishy-washy. I'm not talking to the heathen or the backslider. I'm not even talking to the Sunday morning Christian. I'm talking to the radical worshiper, the presence chasers, the one who praises and rejoices in the calm as well as in the storm. I'm talking to the one who lifts up his voice or her voice to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the good times and in the bad times. Because you know why? The God of the mountain is the God in the valley. The God of the good times is the God in the bad times. The God in the day is still God in the night. Praise his holy name. Oh Lord, that we will never be ashamed. We are not ashamed of the Lord our God. We're not ashamed of his son. We're not ashamed of his Holy Spirit. We're not ashamed of the gospel. And I say again, we are not ashamed. We will praise you, O Lord, our God. Let me ask you, do you know a God like that? A God who blesses you because you have chased his presence. Do you know a God like that who will sustain you in the good times and in the bad times? Do you know a God who will give you peace, shalom peace, in times of trouble, though the storms rage against you, though the winds batter you, the waves toss you to and fro, because the storms of life have raised up against you, yet you have peace, 
peace that passes all understanding. You don't even understand it yourself. All you know is that there's no worries in the Lord. He will work it out for you. I place all of my cares, all of my concerns on you, Lord Jesus, because you care for me. Do you know a God like that? If you don't know him, if you don't know him as Lord and Savior, I can introduce you to him. All you got to do is to come in faith. Ask him for forgiveness and he'll forgive you. Once he forgives you, you're a child of God. You're changed. It is by faith that we are saved. Would you like to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today? Here's how. Say this prayer with me. Mean it in your heart. He will hear and he'll forgive you. Say this prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you. Help me to be bold and confident. Lord, that I might rejoice and praise in the good times and in the bad times. In the highs and in the lows. Lord God, when things are going good and when things are going bad, help me to know your peace. Your peace that passes all understanding. Thank you for forgiving me, Jesus. I accept your free gift of life. Now help me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do to get a Bible. You've got to get into the Word of God. You've got to read your Bible every day. Otherwise, how will you know what God is saying to you? How will you have a sword? Because the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. You see, it's, it's a weapon. It's our defense. It's our offense. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, and we must learn to use it, just like Jesus used it in the desert when he was being tempted of the devil. So you got to get into the Word. you got to memorize the Scriptures. you got to commit them to heart. For thy word have I hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Then you got to find yourself a Bible-believing church. A church that still believes in righteousness, still believes in holiness. A church that still believes, thus saith the Lord that there's a right way and a wrong way. Not one of those progressive churches that says anything goes. It's not one of those churches you're looking for. Because God, Jesus, when He comes back, He's coming back for the redeemed, the blood washed, those that are, are kept their garments clean and unstained by the world. You cannot be a friend of the world and be a friend of God. It just doesn't work. If you see the world, if you see everybody going after a certain thing, turn away from that certain thing. Because the world does not chase after God, nor His presence. So whatever the world is chasing after, whatever the world is supporting, no matter what it is, no matter how they make it sound, right? That is not you. Your way is the narrow way. Your gate is the narrow gate. Straight is that path. Straight is the way. Narrow is the gate. So, get into that church. Be discipled in that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that he wants you to be doing. Bearing fruit. And he say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you. The Lord loves you, and we love you too. My name's Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.